Good everyone. I'm Dr. Allison Arwady, Commissioner at the Chicago Department of Public Health. Uh, we're here to give the weekly COVID-19 update. I'm joined today by Chicago Public Schools CEO Pedro Martinez, as well as Dr. Geraldine Luna, Medical Director at the Chicago Department of Public Health. So we continue to have overall very good news in terms of making progress against COVID-19 and specifically the Omicron variant here in Chicago. First of all, at the national level, the whole country continues to be very much in the Omicron surge. Just to put it in some perspective, nationally, we're averaging over 200 cases per 100,000 people per day. Chicago is currently averaging 71. And you can see Illinois and nationally are about the same, but Chicago is now about a third of the level of what we're seeing nationally and coming down very well. That said, the whole country remains on the travel advisory. Um, as a reminder, for the fourth consecutive week, we've not changed a single thing on the way we count this, but the number of cases remains very high across the city. And for folks who are unvaccinated, I am concerned, of course, about people taking unnecessary risks with COVID, and that would include uh, travel right now. Variant surveillance. So it is nearly all Omicron. 99.3% of uh, the tests that are being done to look to see what variant we're seeing, not just in Chicago and Illinois, but Region 5, which is the Midwest, are Omicron. Uh, and just 0.7% are Delta. We're not really seeing anything else showing up. Uh, there's been a lot of attention in the last couple of days on the so-called stealth Omicron variant. Um, I want to be very clear that is just a subtype of Omicron. It has not been named even a variant of interest. Uh, we're keeping an eye on it. There's nothing that we've seen at this point um, that is raising a high level of concern, but please rest assured we're watching it and we'll let you know if there's anything to be interested or concerned about. So how are we doing here? Across Chicago, last seven days, we are now back down to averaging fewer than 2,000 cases per day. That still leaves us in the very high transmission category, over 800 does, but this is down from nearly 10,000 a day at the peak, so really fast decrease. You see that our test positivity and our non-ICU capacity have both moved from the very high transmission into the high transmission over the last week. Our positivity is now at 7.9%. Very glad to see that back down in the single digits, down from 14% a week ago. And our non-ICU capacity, we've got uh, 1,216 on average. Chicagoans not in the ICU, still in the high, but out of the very high risk. And then for the ICU, we've got 267 folks still average with COVID in the ICU, but that's moved from high to substantial. So a really nice improvement on those highline metrics over the last week. If we look at this graphically, these are our cases. And look at that. The peak daily from January 4th is at almost 10,000 cases. And seeing that huge increase up December to January and then coming back down just as quickly as we've seen it go up is great news. Um, that's what we saw in South Africa. We weren't sure we would see it here, but the good news is we have been. So as I said, um, numbers remain very high. I don't want people thinking this is over. The risk is not is not still high, but we are, we are well past the surge and continuing to decrease nicely. Um, our test positivity similarly peaked January 1, right around 20%. That also has been declining. I know those of you who follow this closely are happy to see test positivity back in the single digits, as am I, um, and we'll want to see that continuing to drop. I want to highlight one thing that I continue to see posted a lot on social media is this idea that the vaccine is not doing anything anymore. Couldn't be less true. Number one, Certainly, we have seen more breakthrough infections in Chicago during the Omicron surge, meaning people who are vaccinated are more likely to get diagnosed with an infection. Most of those are mild, but yes, that is true. However, vaccinated and boosted, both Chicagoans, remain half as likely to be diagnosed with COVID as unvaccinated Chicagoans. There is nothing else that cuts your risk of getting COVID in half. Masks don't do that. Distancing doesn't do that. Ventilation doesn't do that. Vaccination remains the number one thing, even when the surge is higher, in terms of even helping protect yourself against infection. But more importantly, 
as we're all thinking about what is this going to look like to learn with COVID, it's about can we turn COVID into a disease that doesn't cause severe illness, that doesn't put people in the hospital or kill them. And that is where the vaccines have truly shown their most important benefit. So let's talk about hospitalizations. COVID hospitalizations in Chicago, meaning people newly diagnosed with COVID each day, yes, they are decreasing, as you see on the graph there, but there are still more Chicago residents being newly hospitalized right now each day with COVID than at any point since May of 2020, the beginning of the pandemic. We're currently averaging 154 new hospitalizations every day. That's down from a peak of 263. But that's not about testing. That's about getting admitted to the hospital. And so our capacity is looking better. But I, if you're hearing that Omicron isn't putting people in the hospital, that's just wrong. Our hospital census also coming down, but hospital census, which means just how many people not getting newly admitted to the hospital every day, but across all Chicago hospitals, how many people have COVID, not in the ICU, but taking up beds, regardless of whether they're a Chicago resident or not, um, that has also started to decrease, thank goodness, but it is higher than at any prior point in the pandemic. Our hospitals remain very stretched. And let me tell you, I am thrilled to see those starting to trend down because we weren't going to be able to go very much further on an increase here without truly threatening the ability to even be able to keep the basics open. So the fact that we're back to 21% of our non-ICU capacity available is great. Our ICU numbers uh, have also just started to decline, similar to where we were last winter. Uh, we are at 16% ICU capacity, so those are also much better. But please don't make the mistake of thinking there are not people getting seriously ill. And so I wanted to address this with a little more data. This is straight off the dashboard, so feel free to explore for yourself. I keep hearing either that nobody or only older people can get seriously ill from the Omicron variant. And it is true, thankfully, that the Omicron variant overall has not made people generally sicker, but the number of infections is so much higher that the number of hospitalizations, as I said, is the highest we've ever seen. The fact is that older people are much more likely to become seriously ill than younger people if they're infected with COVID. We've seen that all along. But we have seen plenty of young Chicagoans and especially unvaccinated young Chicagoans be hospitalized with COVID-19 here in Chicago during this Omicron surge. And yes, that does include some younger people without any serious underlying conditions. I can't predict for you, just looking at you, whether you're gonna be one of the people who gets a serious infection, but I know that the vaccines help, help protect you more than anything else can. So this is Chicago's data. Just since December, this December that just happened through the present, not even two months, we've had at least 6,646 Chicagoans hospitalized with COVID-19, and we have had at least 805 Chicagoans die from COVID-19 just since December, just during Omicron. 673 of those hospitalizations, 10%, and five of those deaths were in Chicagoans age 18 to 29. And 668 of those hospitalizations and 17 of those deaths were in Chicagoans 30 to 39. So yes, it is true, more of the people who are being hospitalized and dying are older. We value older lives just as much, of course, but I keep hearing this myth that younger people don't get sick. And right here in Chicago, it just hasn't been true. And it's one of the reasons we continue to emphasize the need for people, even people who are generally young and generally healthy. Yes, it's about protecting others and getting past the outbreak, but it is also honestly about protecting yourself. Here's the data on that then. Even if people do get a breakthrough COVID infection, vaccinated Chicagoans remain five times less likely to be hospitalized in blue there than unvaccinated Chicagoans just during Omicron. And the recent increase in hospitalizations for kids, for example, in that five to 11, where there's been a lot of attention, we've not seen a huge surge there, thank goodness. But almost all of those among people who are unvaccinated in red there, blue shows um, where there have been vaccinated younger children's hospitalized. But we see this pattern no matter which age group we're looking at. 
And then finally, even if they get a break through COVID infection, vaccinated Chicagoans in the blue lines at the bottom there, going from October all the way forward, also remain five times less likely to die than unvaccinated Chicagoans. And nearly the entire surge of deaths during Omicron has been in unvaccinated Chicagoans. Do you see how those blue lines remain relatively flat, sort of through November and December? It's that red line spiking up. That's the hundreds of excess deaths in unvaccinated Chicagoans. So when I keep making this point, it is about the goal to stay open as a city. It is about the goal to save lives. And it is about the goal of putting vex, putting COVID behind us and learning to live with something that is more manageable. So a few updates. Um, you may have seen some new terminology, and I wanted to make sure people understand what this means. Uh, this is through the CDC. We have already been using it. Um, but where we're asking what's your COVID vaccination status, there's two different terms that we and everybody across the country are using. Fully vaccinated continues to mean you did the most important thing, which is get your primary series of the COVID-19 vaccine at any point. If you got one J&J &J or two Pfizer or Moderna, you have done the baseline and the thing that gives you the big biggest increase in terms of that protection. Up to date though, means that you have received all recommended COVID-19 vaccines, including any booster doses when you're eligible. And so you'll see us be using this up to date terminology. It's better to be up to date, of course, and we've seen boosters provide even better protection, um, but someone can be fully vaccinated and up to date if they just chose to get their first vaccines last week because they're not due for a booster yet. On the other hand, if they got both of their first vaccines a year ago, they would be fully vaccinated, but not up to date because they are due for a booster and haven't gotten one. So when do you get a COVID-19 booster as a reminder? Recommendation, anyone 12 years and older should get boosted. You should get boosted five months after your initial Pfizer series for those over 12 or Moderna series for those over 18. You should get boosted two months after your initial J&J &J vaccination. We strongly encourage people to do that. But the, in terms of the requirement at schools, for the city, to get into high-risk settings, it remains fully vaccinated um, for now. Citywide vaccination rate, we are up over 79% of those who are eligible, five and up, having had a first dose, 71% fully vaccinated, making good progress there, and coverage among 12 to 17 year olds in particular doing really nicely there. Um, we're at almost 77% of our 12 to 17 year olds having gotten a first dose, and the eight, they're right up neck and neck with the 18 to 29 year olds. And we've seen a lot of 18 to 29 year olds and 30 to 39 year olds making the new decision to get vaccinated right now because they're wanting to do some of the things that they that they can't do during the vaccination um, requirement for high-risk places right now so the last myth I wanted to address is that everyone who is going to be vaccinated already has been and I know those of you who have been paying a ton of attention to COVID just think are there still folks out there boy they've been hearing this for a year the fact is thousands of Chicagoans are deciding to get their first vaccine dose every day in Chicago thousands of them. You can look it up on the dashboard and we continue to make good progress. And if you just to put a little bit of a finer detail on it, those zip codes in green are the zip codes that had the biggest percent increase last week in terms of vaccination coverage. Where are those? In the parts of the city we most want to see those increases. And I put those numbers on there just to show the number of first dose vaccinations. 60629 on the southwest there. 956 first dose vaccinations last week alone uh, in on, in the north side there in Austin in the two in the two um, groups there if you combine those two zip codes another nearly 900 people getting their first dose of vaccine in addition to that people getting boosters kids choosing to get vaccinated etc and our Healthy Chicago Equity Zones remain um, sort of our primary work on the ground in terms of doing a lot of that vaccine outreach work. Just as a reminder, we've got these, seven, these six zones across the city. Each of them has a lead organization. So in the far south, for example, it's Phalanx Family Services. In North Central, it's Swedish Covenant Hospital. And then in turn, each of those leads, they've all received funding from the health department. And then each of those leads in turn 
Western is working with at least one community-based organization in every community in that region. There's funding that is flowing to those community-based organizations, and together they're working on the strategies, the trusted messengers, the sites that need vaccination, the outreach, et cetera. And so I just wanted to give a big shout out to the leads um, and all of the community-based organizations getting this done every day. And I wanted to just end with an ask here. Trusted messengers can also be you if you are someone who has been vaccinated. And we want trusted messengers to be you because for somebody in your family, for somebody in your circle, if there's someone who there has already been some trust around that has nothing to do with vaccine, we're not asking you to try to browbeat people. We definitely don't want you shaming people into vaccine, but we want you as much as you feel comfortable doing, being confident sharing some of the data and some of the news and some of the approaches that we've seen can work. So I wanna remind you about our vaccine ambassador course, free, through Malcolm X College, you get a certificate uh, from city colleges. There is no requirement here. It is open to anybody in the public. And there are four modules available. They each take maybe half an hour. Number one is just about COVID-19 and the US healthcare system. Number two, COVID vaccine questions answered. There's a lot in there about how the vaccine was developed, timelines, a lot. It's, it's really based around what were the questions we were hearing here in Chicago and that, that if you want to feel confident in talking to people, we want to make sure you understand. Three is where the money meets, meets the road. Having conversations about vaccines. It gives you specific strategies about how not to push it how to listen first, how to really have some practical suggestions. And then there's a bonus module that we've added based on feedback around kids and vaccine. ccc.edu slash vaccine ambassador. We've had thousands of Chicagoans uh, take this and we'd love to add to that. So please check it out. Vaccine safety remains the most frequently specified reason here in Chicago across all race ethnicity groups that people give for not having been vaccinated yet. That's the kind of thing that where you're taking the course, we're sharing information, we can make sure people do have appropriate, up-to-date information about the extremely safe um, COVID vaccine. And vaccine remains widely available. You can get vaccinated at home. Uh, we're continuing to sign people up. We've got availability if you look out a couple of weeks. Um, and our family COVID vaccine clinics are going really well. Sunday, right, was breaking all these records for snow and cold and all the rest of it. We did more than 500 vaccinations at the city clinic, the city college uh, clinic on Saturday and um, hundreds more. Five, more than 500 at the one on Sunday and uh, more than 300 at the one on Saturday. So we're going strong. Many of those are people getting their first dose of vaccine and I encourage you to sign up as well. If you're getting, if you're feeling sick, we're building testing capacity, you should be able to find a test. I would say at this point in Chicago without too much trouble. Um, these are new locations that are all funded by CDPH to expand into um, to anybody in the community. Um, and then IDPH has funded the one at Northeastern Illinois. So for folks who may be working downtown, um, the Dirksen US Courthouse, Monday to Friday, nine to four uh, is open for shield testing. This is the saliva testing that people have been interested in. Um, we've supplemented that a couple of nights a week at DePaul. They're opening to the community four to seven on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And then at Northeastern Illinois, um, that's available again to the public free of charge, Monday and Wednesday, Tuesday and Thursday in those hours. Um, again, just go to chai.gov slash COVID test. Order your at-home test if you haven't from the feds. Those will be free, covidtest.gov. Your healthcare provider, community health centers, pharmacies, community-based testing. Um, all have options available, but these are some newer public facing ones. And then a positive test, as you've heard me say, right now when numbers are high is a positive test. If you get a positive test, including on a home test, including on a rapid test, including on I don't care what you fill in there, a positive test is a positive test. We need you to stay home and isolate even if you're waiting on other test results, et cetera. And if you are at high risk, meaning you're older, you have an underlying condition, we need you to tell your doctor, please, if you have a positive test. Why is that? Because there are treatments available for people who get COVID. 
that help keep them out of the hospital. There are antivirals available, three different ones, two that you take by mouth and one that you take by IV. And there is one, what's called a monoclonal antibody that you take by IV. Details are all on our website about this. And I went over it on Facebook this morning. These are medications that can help keep you out of the hospital, but they need to be taken in the first few days of infection. The sooner, the better. And depending on the medication, you can't take it at all if, if, if it's been five days since your, system, since your symptoms started for example. And so what I don't want you to do is wait. Whether you are vaccinated, whether you are unvaccinated, you get a positive test. I want you to isolate and I want you to reach out. If you're at higher risk, talk to your healthcare provider. These are available in Chicago. They still remain in relatively shorter supply across the country, but we've worked hard with providers here. So hospitals and providers associated with them know how to get them, federally qualified health centers do. There are some pharmacies that have it, but you cannot get these medications without getting evaluated by um, a doctor or another um, healthcare provider because there's details around some can't be used if you're pregnant, some can't be used if you're on certain medications. There's timelines, there's details. So you cannot walk into a pharmacy and get one of these. But if you are sicker, we want you to reach out. And this is increasingly going to be something that will come along with vaccine. Vac do, don't think that this replaces vaccine, but in terms of a second level of protection, it's important. And finally, get call our number, chai.gov slash COVIDVAX or 312-746-4835 uh, with any questions or any help finding vaccine, finding testing, finding resources. Uh, if you're isolating, quarantining, we help with all of that. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Awadi. So this is the latest uh, that we want to share with you where we're at with, now these are tests completed as well as our positivity rate. And so that's for the week of the 16th through the 22nd. You can see uh, we hit the highest uh, test completed. And then with that, we also saw, uh, we are seeing a low positivity rate of 2.51. Last week we were more than double that. So we're starting to see also a decline in positivity rates similar to the city. This is the number of tests that have been administered. But you can also see our actual tests that we actually did last, last week were, again, over 56,000. Again, this is the highest we've ever done, and we're continuing to build capacity with testing. You can see we've done almost 470,000 tests now since we started testing. So I'm, I'm, I'm continuing to be optimistic that we're going to continue to build this capacity. Um, we are, are, you can see our registration is now hitting now over 87,000. We saw a significant increase. Uh, I'll tell you right now what our focus is, is making sure that every one of our schools is meeting the minimum 10% threshold of unvaccinated students. So in other words, we are making sure that across our 515 schools that we have a minimum of 10% of students that are unvaccinated, they've given us consent for testing. I can tell you right now that we're now close to 90% of hitting that target. So our focus is going to be to get to 100% so right now that's that's the urgency so we're spending a lot more time in those schools and then once we build that we'll continue to again see uh, more momentum overall to continue to get more testing uh, this is where we're at with vaccinations you can see where our staff has been over 90 percent uh, again for us it's still uh, you know for our 12 year olds and up it's still a very stubborn number that just moves up slowly um, our 5 to 11 continue to move up what is uh, exciting for me is that we now have 148,000 students with at least one dose so this is the highest we've seen so we're seeing a lot more momentum but it is right now the 5 to 11 year olds that are driving that again I would just ask I love student advocacy I love the the passion that our students have we need to get more and more students to encourage you know just like the ambassadors to encourage more of our 12 year olds and up to get vaccinated. Um, so let's talk about cases. So this is really, you know, so this is the, the latest cases for this last week from the 16th to the 22nd. You can see we actually hit uh, 2278 students, 670 staff. It's interesting, the staff has actually declined. You can see that you, that's a really clear decline from the week before. The students have crept up a bit, but I'll tell you what's really interesting is I looked at the data day by day and a couple of things. One is there's a couple of lags. So first of all, uh, you know, first the test is given or, or test is, you know, given. There's a lag in terms of processing of the test as well as the reporting of the test. So what's really interesting when I look at this data, it's very front-loaded in the front of the week 
and it starts declining very sharply at, towards the end of the week. So what we're going to be watching this week is whether that continued decline stays very, very low. So what, what, uh, what we're seeing right now, it looks like, you know, as the city peaked, remember, cases start in the neighborhood, they come into our schools, so we see sort of a lag from that. We think we might have peaked in our cases potentially last week, uh, right in the beginning uh, to, towards the middle of last week. Remember, last week also was a four-day week. And so we're seeing a very, very sharp, steady decline as we got towards the end of the week and into the weekend. So again, we're going to be watching that for the rest of the rest of this week, and then we'll be able to share that with you next week. Um, now with that, and we've, we have said this, and this pains me as a parent, we do have the highest number of students in quarantine. We have over 19,400 students. Uh, we have 809 staff. Uh, so again, we have said this, we knew with cases coming, we're going to quarantine more, uh, more students. We're going to be much more conservative in transitioning classrooms very, very quickly. We have been doing that. Uh, again, what I'm optimistic about is that we're seeing cases significantly decline, especially as I saw at the end of last week. Uh, but meanwhile, we are, in terms of actions, everybody, we move fast. This is not, we move very, very quickly. I say that at, at the fact that, again, it's a, it's a real pain point for, for our families. Um, you know, I said this last week, what makes me feel optimistic is our strategies, and, and the reason I feel like we're gonna, in the, you know, we're playing the long game here, but with expanded uh, testing consents, expanded capacity, we're seeing more students get vaccinated, although it is my five to 11 year olds that are driving it, but still, you know, we're seeing more and more of our students get vaccinated. And again, our continued investments in PPE and mitigation strategies, while cases are starting to stabilize, that is the winning strategy. That is, that is what gives me a optimism as we're finishing now our first semester. The second semester could be very different than the first semester. So this came up, and this is something that uh, I went deeper just based on the concerns that I started seeing. Um, and so, you know, I asked the questions, okay, help me understand how cases are reported because we've always reported everybody all open and closed cases at the district level. That's never changed. That's always been consistent from the, from the beginning of, of, of the year. Um, what has evolved over time is how do, we, how do we actually show that data at the school level? So I asked, I said, can you help me understand, help me understand what the concerns are. So first of all, you know, and you know, I never claim to be a, a specialist in testing, but <laughs> this, you know, I've been forced to get deeper and deeper. So the way it works right now is we have a website that anybody can report a positive test. Anybody, any staff person or any student. It could be a home test. It could be a test that's done at one of the testing sites. It could be one from our school uh, testing. It could be a home test we gave to the family. It comes from anywhere. So the good news is it's very easy. So it's very easy, that was the goal. Here's, let me tell you the challenges that they found specifically. So now when cases were low, we were able to you know, quickly correct data. So one of the things that we found because it was so easy, so I'll give you an example. We test a child, for example, in our weekly testing at a school on a Monday. We, you know, the parent gets the result, let's say hopefully you know, ideally within 20, well, around 24 hours. So by Tuesday, the parent gets the result. Many times our parents will go in and report that test through our website. Meanwhile, because we got the result and it's, and it's part of, our, uh, part of the, the process we have with the vendor, we get the test result also and it gets duplicated. And then some of our families, and Dr. Awadia said this, in some families they still want to get another test, right? Because the test could be a home, could be a weekly. Again, then they go get tested again and guess what? They report it again. So we constantly see these, these issues. At the district level, we can manage that because again, it's a pretty large scale. At the school level, it gets very tricky. And so again, you know, I, I understood that from the team. I said, okay, I understand what your concerns are. Um, I also fully understand and appreciate the fact that parents need relevant, actionable data. And the most relevant and actionable data is at the school level. So what, we're, what I'm working with the team on is let's figure out how do we make sure that we have accurate data, right? Because we don't want data that has you know, duplicates and triplicates in it, especially at the school. At the district level, not a big deal, but at the school level, you can see numbers get magnified significantly. So how do we make sure we provide accurate data? So one of the things that we're looking at, for example, and by the way, I wanna say this, thank you for everybody who pays attention to this data. I mean, again, we, this has been an evolving process, folks, since the beginning of the school year. We need to continue to evolve and we need to continue to just learn. Um, but for us, you know, one of the things we're looking at now is, okay, 
how do we, you know, what other strategies that we can try to maximize accuracy while still making sure that we're providing complete and relevant data to our families? So one, for example, we're looking at is, can we separate the self-reporting from the actual screening tests, you know, that we do on a weekly basis? A month ago, two months ago, I wouldn't want to do that because, frankly, our weekly testing wasn't where it needed to be. We're now hitting well over 50,000, 53,000, 55,000 tests every week with more capacities coming. By the way, we have trained our nurses uh, already, so they're going to be augmenting testing starting you know, very shortly, uh, you know, as early as next week. So we're going to see even more ramp up testing, uh, especially again as we continue to push for more consents. And so again, those are the strategies that are going to be our winning solution. So just know I'm very committed to making sure, again, we provide relevant information to our families. But folks, every, again, let me remind you though, this is not connected at all to how fast we're moving in terms of our actions. We are quarantining families very, very fast. This is not impacting that at all. So I'll tell you, for our families that are in quarantine, they're 19,000 plus, they all know they're in quarantine. They all know there was cases in their schools. They all know because they're literally living it every day. And trust me, I get emails from the family saying, Super CEO, you know, can you help me? Because again, I, my child needs to be in school, and that's what pains me as I, I continue to as we continue to navigate through this pandemic. Um, so I shared this with you last week, and this is what I wanted to. So we have been working uh, with uh, CDPH, IDPH. Uh, so what we are going to be doing is adopting the new CDC guidelines that will be pro prospective February 1st. So any child who is in quarantine from February 1st on, they will be allowed to return five days after versus 10 days. And it's five days after they've been identified as having been positive. So it's five five days and it's not, I believe Dr. White, it's not school days, I think it's just five days, but <laughs> I don't want him to speak. Okay, so five days. So that will start prospectively February 1st. Here's what I ask families, please. I know we have 19,000 students in quarantine right now. I know they're gonna ask, can I bring my child back right now? The challenge with these new CDC, it's not as simple as you just bring your child back after five days. We have to follow specific protocols for those children for the next five days after the fifth day. And those are the operational uh, procedures that we're putting in place in the schools, and so we need to give the schools time because we gotta do this right, folks. We cannot bring children back in a way that's gonna create risk for them or their peers. And so I ask for the patience on that, but, but anybody who's quarantined, whether it's staff or students, effective from February 1st on, we will be, we will be aligned to the new CDC guidelines. Um, and so, again, so I wanna make sure that that's clear. And uh, with that, I'll bring back Dr. Luna. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Muy buenas tardes. Yo soy la doctora Geraldine Luna, directora médica del Departamento de Salud Pública de Chicago. Y hoy les vengo a dar actualizaciones. A partir del 20 de enero, más de 68.5 millones de personas en los Estados Unidos han sido infectadas con el coronavirus y 857,644 han muerto. Según el periódico de New, eh, New York Times, esta mañana se discutió esos valores. La variante Omicron ha llevado los informes diarios de casos del país a niveles récord. Es la primera vez en la pandemia que vemos estos casos, eh, el alza tan desmedida que hemos experimentado en estos días. Chicago actualmente tiene 90 casos diarios reportados por cada 100,000 personas. Y la variante del Omicron ha llevado a 800,000 nuevos casos reportados por día en todos los Estados Unidos. Aquí en Chicago y a nivel nacional también, <coughs> tenemos muy buenas noticias. Afortunadamente, nos encontramos frente al pico del repunte y ya lo hemos pasado. Hoy los casos están en 1,919 por día en, en promedio de hace, cinco, de hace tres días atrás donde nos encontramos en 5,500 por día. Eso es algo récord. Según ha subido los casos con el Omicron, así vemos el desdoblamiento de estos casos. También vemos la cero positividad 
que está en 7.9, esa es la mitad de lo que lo teníamos la semana pasada. Estas son muy buenas noticias que nos encontramos en la parte donde estamos recuperándonos o estamos devolviéndonos, bajando los casos del repunte por el Omicron. También vemos que la capacidad hospitalaria y de los intensivos ha aumentado. 21 para los hospitales, 16 para la sala de intensivo, y esos números siguen progresando de forma positiva, pero nos encontramos todavía en alto riesgo, alto, significativamente alto riesgo en casos cuando estamos hablando de transmisión comunitaria, así que no queremos que nuestras familias bajen la guardia. Los casos de COVID-19 alcanzaron su punto máximo en enero 4 y han ido disminuyendo desde entonces. El pico de la positividad llegó a 19.1 y hoy lo tenemos en 7%. Las tasas de infección siguen disminuyendo y la, segunda, la, la vacuna sigue siendo altamente protectora. Así que esas personas que piensen que la vacuna dejó de protegernos porque estamos viendo el Omicron, la variante de Omicron, se equivocan. Hemos visto los números, las estadísticas, la protección máxima ocurre cuando no tan solo te vacunas, pero también tienes tu refuerzo al día. Y estas son las medidas nuevas del CDC. Decir eh, completamente vacunado significa tener todas sus vacunas, pero cuando se, decimos estar vacunados al día, significa que si eres elegible para recibir tu refuerzo, también tengas tu refuerzo. Las nuevas hospitalizaciones diarias de Chicago han comenzado a estabilizarse y las cifras siguen siendo muy altas, pero ya lo tenemos en 262. Siguen disminuyendo y las personas vacunadas tienen menos probabilidades de experimentar la enfermedad grave. Y usted es donde cada quien quiere que la vacuna sea más protectiva y protege contra muerte significativamente. Las muertes entre adultos no vacunados ha aumentado mientras que el riesgo de la muerte entre adultos vacunados se ha mantenido bajo o casi ninguno. Miles de Chicago, eh, chicagoenses toman la vacuna y toman la decisión diaria de vacunarse. Y los códigos postales donde hemos visto la mayor aceptación son el 060639 y el 60609. Así que felicidades. Y el aviso de viajero... Ahora tenemos la cuarta semana consecutiva que todos nuestros estados se encuentran en la lista de aviso. Como siempre, le pedimos que, por favor, si está infectado con el COVID-19, si está vacunado, por favor, aíslese. Si no está vacunado, por favor, no viaje. Y recuérdese, si es elegible para recibir la vacuna, por favor, reciba su vacuna para que tenga su máxima protección. Y los esfuerzos de la vacuna continúan a nivel comunitario. Este fin de semana tenemos la clínica Kennedy King este sábado abierta de 9 a 2, vacunando desde pediátricos hasta adultos y dando refuerzos con incentivos de hasta 100 dólares, 50 por cada vacuna. Y el domingo tenemos a Olive Harvey también vacunando de 9 a 2 de la tarde con los mismos incentivos. Así que sí, ya tienen niños de 5 años en, en adelante, son elegibles. Y el programa Protege a Chicago al Hogar sigue efectivo, sigue en pie y sigue, eh, ¿verdad?, eh, a, vacunando a nuestras familias con el, eh, la capacidad de vacunar hasta 10 por visita. Así que si quieres recibir la vacuna en su casa, acuérdense en 312-746-4835 y lo hacemos posible con esos incentivos también que funcionan. Y le devuelvo ahora el micrófono a la doctora Arwari. I give back the phone, the microphone to Dr. Arwari. We'll take some questions. We have a couple of mics. What do you feel about the fact that you guys weren't involved in that decision? Because what it's left is the impression that um, the school district was trying to mislead mislead parents, because there was no indication on the website that, that there was any change in data, and you know yet there was a major change in how data was reported. 
Yeah, so, you know, a couple things on this. One, um, you know, I would echo Mr. Martinez in saying, I love it when people are paying attention to data and raising questions. There's nothing I like more because it tells us that um, there are, you know, and again, we don't, as you know, we don't have, the CPS has their website and CDPH has ours, but I, I take very seriously when people give questions or have feedback about the, um, the city dashboard, and I know CPS does as well. Um, you know, we don't consult on the level of sort of how data may be portrayed with the zillions of people who we oversee. The health department, you know, just as a reminder, our high level role here is to make sure that we're not seeing signs of trouble in schools. And we do have access, and we've been getting more access just to make sure that where we have we can provide perhaps some additional support around data messaging, et cetera, because I've got a team that does a lot of that. But what I'm interested in is not sort of what is this overarching number. Um, I do completely agree that separating what is happening on screening testing from the other reports that are coming in 100% makes sense. And I think a goal of moving toward doing that at the school level really helps people understand what those risks are. Behind the scenes at the health department, just like we do for other schools, not, not just CPS, other settings, that's what we're looking at. We're looking to say, you know, number one, are we seeing, we know what the positivity is at the city level, right? We know what the positivity is at the district level or at any other school level. And then are we seeing schools that are significantly above that? That is one warning sign that there may be trouble there and you wanna act on that very quickly. Number two is that all pediatric cases get reported full stop to the city of Chicago, right? So I want to just make sure people understand that. They are all reported in the data that we're sharing. Behind the scenes, my team is doing that data cleaning and matching and not double reporting, and that is a ton of work. I think, you know, the decisions that a, a school district is making about how to, you know, how to put that forward, I completely, you know, I know there was not ill intent in this. There's nothing that is trying to be hidden. But I think helping explain to people what you're, sh what you're showing and why is, is important. Um, and I think a particularly, um, you know, in a system that's had a lot of attention on this, uh, wanting to make sure that we're being as clear as possible about that. What we are the most interested in at the health department is are we seeing clusters? Are we seeing outbreaks? Are we seeing things that need public health action? The number of cases at a school, even in a district, doesn't really matter to me. It's about are we seeing a number that's that's been clean, that's been investigated, and is there a suggestion that there's something unexpected happening. Not just sort of at a school that's got 4,000 students, but at a classroom level. And so we do look behind the scenes, as you know, at, uh, and we do this with CPS to see, you know, how many classroom settings are we seeing that have three cases in them? And then do the investigation. Are those siblings? What's the deal? Okay, act on it. We're doing that and consistent, not seeing anything unexpected there and seeing it fall in line. And so, Really, the health department is about making sure all schools remain places that do not put students at increased risk. And I remain very confident that's the, that, that, is, that that is true. Um, and I think at the school district level, we will certainly support as they continue to just make sure people have confidence um, in the, the, the very good data um, that they do have. You know, I think, um, so Sarah, even when this issue came up, I thought about your question that you had last week, which is, um, and you know, and our the team is working really hard. I can tell you. I mean, the team you know meets on a regular basis. They they consult with with CDPH on specific cases. And I you know when I when I got when I went deeper into what was going on, just to try to understand it, because there was no uh, ill intent at all. I didn't fully appreciate like the complexities of it. And I'll give you an example. We knew there was going to be a surge in cases. We knew that. We knew there were going to be a surge in cases coming out of the holidays. We knew that. What I didn't fully appreciate is when those cases are reported, even though it's because the schools are closed, right? They're not in session. They, you know, it's a, it's in in the old way. It was always attaching those cases still to schools, even though they weren't the schools weren't open. And so again, when cases were low, we could clean that up, right? And we would say these are actionable cases. These are not actionable. You get into all this, and again, I'm not the expert, but I get into all this terminology, which is very confusing for families, by the way. So. And so I think the goal was, can we just try to make sure we have more accurate data? But I think the unintended consequence was, well, the answer is not 
close off so much of the information. And so I think, you know, so I'm telling, you know, again, the team is going back and say, okay, let's try to achieve these goals. And for me, the number one question is, what does a parent need to know that again, so about their school and about cases? And right now, the most accurate data we have is our weekly testing. And because we are doing so much more of it, that's why we're now in this question of, should we, let's try to at least have that, or at least at a minimum, maybe, you know, and it could be that we provide all of it, but we can maybe do tabs to say, here's the screening data versus maybe self-reporting data. And then within the self-reporting data, we have to figure out how to isolate cases that came from the weekend, cases that it wasn't when a school was in session versus cases when school. So, so those are the complexities. What I will say again is, Thank you for people looking at this data. Thank you for people pushing us. I think this is this is the way we continue to evolve and get better. We're also learning as we go along. But our goal is gonna be, my number one goal, providing relevant information to parents so that it's timely. Again, <clears throat> now what I would be really worried about is if we were waiting for this to act. Mm -hmm. I'm not seeing that. I'm seeing the opposite. <laughs> as soon as we're getting the cases, regardless of the source, we are acting very, very quickly while you're seeing so many children in quarantine, which creates other concerns for me. And so that's why, again, we wanted to adopt this new CDC guidelines as soon as we could operationalize it. Um, just one more question. When you said that after the, someone quarantines for five days, then for the next five days, there's things that have to be in place. Can you just explain a little bit more about what those things have to be in place for those next five days? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and this reflects the, the, the science um, that shows that the risk goes down significantly after the five days, but it's not really considered gone until about 10 days. And so number one, we want to be extra careful to make sure that everybody understands that anyone who has symptoms can't come to school in that day six to ten period. And that's important because people may hear, oh, I've been out five days, I'm fine now. And if, you know, if it's a child who was infected, if we're talking isolation and they're still having a fever, I don't care how many days it is, they need to be home. So we need to have extra attention on both the isolation and the quarantine side around symptom screening and making sure parents, staff, everybody has that awareness. Secondly, we want to have extra attention to masking. And this is similar, and this is similar at the at the city level. Um, really making sure, not that the schools are not paying attention to this at all times, but particularly in that uh, six to ten day period period, really making sure that, that that everything that is possible to be done around masking and distancing and being extra careful is there. There also may be the need to limit um, some of the, you know, potentially extracurricular type activities. I'm not going to get into the details of that, um, depending a little bit on the situation. Um, but, but the point is, we want to do this, and we have been advising carefully on this, um, but we know that it's important to keep everybody's confidence that these schools remain uh, settings that are not more of a source of spread than anywhere else. I am very confident that that is true. I have no reason to think that that will happen with the shortening of the quarantine, but we want to put those extra safety things just to sort of belt and suspenders, make sure everybody is aware. We're excited to shorten it. We'll be following the data from around the country um, and making sure all of details like that are operationalized well. Uh, Megan Hickey from CBS Chicago. You touched on this at the beginning of your presentation, but just we've been getting questions about this Omicron subvariant. Yeah. What does that mean, and and why aren't you concerned right now? Sure. Um, so yeah, I mentioned it because I knew there'd been a lot of attention. So. Um, this is what people are sometimes calling the stealth variant. I appreciate you using the term subvariant because that is actually the more appropriate term at this point. All it is, it's still Omicron. It's just Omicron sort of certain letters point one versus certain letters point two. Um, it's a slight variation um, in terms of what is being picked up, but I want to be really, really clear. It has not even been classified as a variant of interest yet. And let me just remind you that every time there is a quote new variant this isn't even a new variant it's just considered a slightly different flavor of the current one we've seen that before that's not atypical every time there's a new variant first of all it'll get a name so if this is something we have to worry about nobody will call it the stealth something it would get a it would get a greek letter name but that's if it's something we're concerned about it, it goes from variant we're monitoring to variant of interest, meaning we're interested, to variant of concern, to variant of high consequence. This is not even on that scale yet. 
So um, we've not seen evidence that it's making people sicker. We've not seen evidence it's behaving differently. I get the world is very attuned to variants right now and we'll be watching it, but I want you to know that we have the ability to detect that subvariant here in Chicago, just like we do um, other types of subvariants. And I'm not seeing anything at this point that gives me um, a lot of concern at all. Um, and if we start to see any signs of concern, we will be the first you know, to let you know it's a variant of interest, it's a variant of concern, and go on from there. And just to clarify, have you seen the subvariant here? No. Okay. Um, hi, is this one on? Oh, sure. Kate, uh, Kate Chapel, NBC Chicago. I'm hoping you can touch on both uh, the FDA revoking EAU or EUA, sorry, for um, Eli Lilly and Regeneron. Mm. Does that concern you at all, um, Omicron's resistance to these drugs? We were kind of relying not only on the vaccines, but these monoclonal antibodies and these drugs moving forward to get out of the pandemic. And I'll wait to ask. Sure. Um, yeah, so it does not surprise me at all um, that, that that has happened. And in fact, we were anticipating it happening for a few weeks now. For those who may not have been following this, let me just give a little bit of context. Do you remember how I said, if you get sick with COVID, whether you're vaccinated, whether you're unvaccinated, and you're someone who is at severe risk for getting hospitalized, I want you to call your doctor. That is to make sure that you can get treatments that are increasingly available that help keep you out of the hospital. For most of the last year or so, really what we had available were three different, what are called monoclonal antibody treatments. Um, and two of them, the two that were being used the most, don't work against Omicron, they just don't. And so over the past few weeks, Weeks, there's actually been some work to say what percentage is Omicron in a given area and should we be using it? We've not been using those those two for, for weeks here in Chicago, knowing that most of what we had was Omicron. Filling in the gap there is the third monoclonal antibody, um, uh, which is available here in Chicago and three other antivirals. And so that's where um, the, the the remdesivir, which is the, actually the very first FDA approved, like not even EUA, the first FDA fully approved drug that had good evidence for treating COVID, it got full approval back in 2020 to treat people who were severely ill and hospitalized with COVID. That now, after additional studies, is now also allowed to be used, and there's been good data that shows it can also help keep people out of the hospital. So that's one of the ones that's in. It's an IV, just like the um, just like the monoclonal antibodies are, but it's not. It's it's helping stop the the virus from copying. And then there's these two new oral pills, right? One from Pfizer, one from Merck. Um, all of these are new, and they were coming just in time. Seeing again, one of the things we worry about with variants is you can lose treatments, and so we were not dependent dependent on those here in Chicago. We had already switched to not be using them given that we knew we had a pretty early Omicron surge here. And it is a moment where the whole country is surging that there are concerns about accessing therapeutics for sure. But I want people to hear that all three of the antivirals as well as the one monoclonal antibody, there are places that have this here in Chicago right now. It is somewhat limited, so I'm not promising it's sort of easy to get, and you have to see your doctor. And there will be some prioritization of that where we need to. We gotta make sure people getting cancer treatment are sort of first in line to get that. Um, but these are increasingly, those orals couldn't have come at a better time in terms of what we're gonna need in a long-term kind of way, much easier than the IVs and the, and, the, um, and the antibodies. These don't replace vaccine, like I said, but they help add to it. Okay. And then the other big headline today, uh, I would say, is that the Pfizer BioNTech um, has started clinical testing uh, for an Omicron specific variant. Mm -hmm. And on that same note, they're focusing on Omicron as, you know, 24 states, including us, are, are kind of out or heading the right direction and, and out of the surge. So what does that say or what is your perspective on what this says about the trajectory of the pandemic and, and how we're looking to vaccines in the future? Yeah, absolutely. So I think the best news, you know, Omicron didn't have a lot of good news associated with it, but the best news that it had associated with it was that it continued to be very protective against severe outcomes, especially if people got a booster. I frankly thought, seeing how this was gonna be moving, that we were gonna need an Omicron vaccine. I was really worried about it. Um, but what we saw was that even though it isn't a perfect match, this is the OG of the vaccine, against those severe outcomes, it's doing its job beautifully. And so 
I am, of course, this is not the first time that we have seen a drug company be working on a new variant. Every single time a new variant, a sub-variant, anything is emerging right away, like that same day even, the scientists are testing the vaccines against this. Are we seeing problems? Where does that need to be? I don't know for sure where we're going in a long-term way. You know, I wouldn't think of it as an Omicron-specific booster as much as maybe a up to, you know, if this is even something that's recommended down the line, Omicron has about 50 mutations that the original one didn't have. And it's sort of pulling in some of the ways it's changed with alpha and beta and gamma and delta and, and Omicron. And it could be something where it's sort of even a tighter match. But I don't know, you know, I'm feeling quite confident about the next at least few months here. Um, I need people to get vaccinated and boosted with what we have available right now. And might this be something like flu, frankly, where every year we actually are testing and looking for the different strains of flu and every year we create a new vaccine that is our best possible guess to a match against the flu variants or the flu strains. That might be what we're doing long term here. But as long as they, they they can continue to keep people out of the hospital, I see it as not like, oh, we're going to have an Omicron um, vaccine that everybody's going to have to take in a month. No, I do not anticipate that. Um, but I think it is important that we can, just in the same way we lost some of the best uh, therapeutics, some of the best treatments, um, we don't want to lose these vaccines, of course. And so I am all for uh, continued testing with all of the appropriate safety and efficacy procedures. And I think it's important that's coming. But no. I don't think we're going to have a, I need to get this one for Omicron. If anything, it could be um, perhaps if we need it down the line, something that had been more tailored to, uh, in, to include all of the, the variations that we've seen. Hi, Dr. Wardy, Amy Jacobson, WIND Radio. I have two questions for you and two for Mr. Martinez. Um, we were here when you and Mayor Lightfoot announced the vaccine mandate. And at that time, you said, when we're on the other edge of this peak. Yeah then we're going to drop the vaccine mandate so that people could have some medical freedoms and you know do things that mm -hmm. we used to be able to do when we were in a free country. So we are clearly on the other side of the peak now. So what measures and metrics have to be in place in order to yep. drop the vaccine mandate? Yeah, so I talked about this on Facebook in some more detail. So as a reminder, we can, you know, the reason we follow those four main things that we've been sharing is they match up broadly against sort of what the CDC is doing. There's four levels of concern from CDC, um, level one, level two, level three, level four. We and the rest of the country remain in level four, high risk, still more people getting admitted to the hospital every day with COVID right now. We are coming down, but we are not in a point. Remember, the main reason we do this is to help keep people from getting into the hospital, honest to God. Like, and, and so my goal, we, we will not keep this in place indefinitely. As we move, seeing some of that movement across our metrics back toward lower, right, that blue, that's what we wanna see. We get down there, we would be, we would not have that in place anymore. Is that happening next week? It's still not. We need to see these things down uh, to a point where the risk is lower. But yeah, we. This is not an indefinite. Um, but it is something that that right now the risk remains high, um, and we're and the risk remains high for unvaccinated people stretching the healthcare system. But do you think vaccine mandates are working? Yes. It, why? What makes because you we've seen so a couple things. We've seen a nice uptick actually in those 18 to 29 and 30 to 39. And we collect data actually at the sites that the health department is running. We talk to folks about why did they decide now is their time to finally get a vaccine a year in. Um, and we are hearing actually quite a lot. Like what, some of the reasons why people are telling us right now is the time they're they're getting vaccinated. A big one is that they they want to be able to do some of these things. Um, Number two, we're hearing people say, I feel like finally it's time. There's more people who I've seen. It's been a year we hear sometimes. I'm less concerned about it. There's a whole range of things. We hear a lot about school. Um, people saying, I want my kids to stay in school. Um, I want to have you know lower risk for my family. And then we just hear people just you know, it's surprising to me, but there are people who are just like, yeah, I decided like today would be the good day. But the but the vaccine requirement. I do think has been important for us feeling more confident in terms of being able to stay open as a city, which remains since last April, since fully reopening, we've not had to shut anything down or put any capacity limits in. And I would love to keep it that way. And this is a way of um, keeping those highest risk settings open while we weather this sort of healthcare um, surge. And honestly, if people aren't vaccinated, at least go get treatment because that helps keep you out of the hospital too. I know I said two questions, but let's talk about that treatment because yeah. we all know a lot of people who've been hit with the Omicron. Yeah. 
they cannot get monoclonal antibodies unless you're 60 plus or obese or morbidly obese or have diabetes. What, give, tell us, and these therapeutics too, it's almost impossible to get therapeutics. They just tell you to, oh, take two Tylenol and then so, four hours, take two more Tylenol. So this is, where, this is where it depends a little bit on the underlying conditions, which I'm saying I want people to call their doctor about. Because it is true that if there is somebody with no underlying, you know, if there's somebody who's 28 years old and has relatively mild COVID, that is not a person at this point for whom um, these are being prioritized. As there is more availability of it, that will be true. But people who have underlying immune conditions, especially if they're over 60, people who, yeah, have diabetes, who have some of this, that is who we want to get treatment. And what our providers in Chicago, especially the outpatient ones, are telling us, you know, we've been doing a lot of work behind the scenes to make sure we have these distributed and there's availability. We're, the, the main challenge that folks are telling us, there's two challenges they're telling us. Number Number one, you can't give these drugs often if people are on a lot of other medications. And the people who are at highest risk, you can't, like the Paxlovid, which is the one, the oral one that people are most interested in, it has a lot of drug-drug interactions. And so some of the people on the most medications can't qualify. Similarly, the other oral medication can't be taken if someone's pregnant. You gotta do some extra testing. And you know, it's not that these are completely without risk, but for somebody who already has a high risk for COVID, absolutely the recommendation and they're hearing not only are those the challenges in terms of but that people are calling them too late people are calling them a weekend 10 days in. they're really feeling bad they maybe have to go to the hospital and it's too late at that point to do those preventive medications so we want people to call i know that there you know i don't want there are challenges here and we don't have enough of it but Right now, there are doses in Chicago that are not being fully used, and I want to see every dose coming to Chicago being fully used. Thank you. Mm -hmm. no. Okay. Um, oh, I have two questions. Well, so we have 19,414 kids that are at home right now. Probably 19,000 are fine, asymptomatic, or just feel fine and don't even have it. The rest of the state is doing a test to stay program. Why aren't we doing that, and when can we be doing that? Yeah, so definitely our test state pilot is still going to be in place. And in fact, I'm going to be optimistic that as we're seeing, because I've, I've been watching the cases and the fact that I saw last week cases dropping so fast, uh, in which I'm going to be watching this week. When you look at our strategies that I that I later uh, later uh, that I put together or that we that we have, add to that in a low case scenario, it's a perfect scenario for a test to stay. And so that's really going to be the goal. We just wanted to make sure that when we had warned our parents that knowing that the surge was coming, we warned ahead of time that we were going to be much more conservative in quarantine children. We're doing that. It pains me. But as cases started declining, with all these other uh, safety procedures that are fully in place, COVID testing, more consent, more vaccinated individuals, all of our other uh, investments that we've done, I think it's a perfect scenario so that when we look at a, a classroom, we can say, you know what? Let's, you know, it's a lowercase scenario. Let's do a test to stay. We have, the, by the way, we have more tests now available in the schools and at home. So the tools are in place. So the only thing we're waiting for is literally for this, for the surge to, to bottom out or not, I shouldn't say bottom out, but to really not only stabilize, but to see a steady decline. We're starting to see that at the school level. Like I said, when I started looking at last week and the weekend, at, at the end of the last week. And last question, a New York State judge uh, struck down the governor's mask mandates for schools. Some districts are defying the judge's order. We have a judge in Sangamon County that's going to be re rendering a decision this Friday. What are you going to do if she says that mask mandates in school are, are no longer? They're illegal. I, I will tell you, the people that I listen to are the medical professionals. So I will, I will stop mandating masks once, I, once Dr. Awadi says stop mandating masks. Uh, trust me, I wish we could not have masks in classrooms, but until it's safe, we're going to continue our mask mandate. Okay, thank you. Thanks, everybody.